I'm J.G. Michael, and this is Parallax Views. Hello, this is Mike Swanson, and in a few moments, you're going to listen to another segment of Parallax Views. But before you do that, let me tell you about my new book, Why the Vietnam War. It's a sequel to my previous book called The War State, which has lots of positive reviews and Amazon's been out for years. But this one is a more detailed case study of how American empire and national security state operate using Vietnam. And I believe it shows also how things work today, how policy is actually made and why. So grab the book on Amazon.com, Why the Vietnam War. This edition of Parallax Views is brought to you by our wonderful sponsors at the $10 tier and above of my Patreon page at patreon.com slash parallaxviews. Once again, that's patreon.com slash parallaxviews. Producers, credit shoutouts to Mark, Arlen, Spartacus, Gunner, Ed, Gratz, James, Mickey, Dan, Brian, The War Nerd, The 42 Group, Nick, Emilia, Chase, Chris, Orc, Black Tuna, Nobody, David, Holland, Martin, Stu, Jeffrey, Thomas, Elliot, Colin, Michael, Matthew Ho, Brace Belden, Galen, Justin, Nick W, Chance, and the Mere M-E-E-R Project. If you'd like to join those listeners in getting your very own producer's credit, on each and every edition of Parallax Views, consider joining them in supporting me at the $10 tier or above on my Patreon page at patreon.com slash parallaxviews. One more time, patreon.com slash parallaxviews. And now, on to the show. Hey there, Parallax Views listeners. On this edition of the program, we're going to be talking about Brexit and its effect on literature with Dulcie Everett, author of the book Brexit, The Problem of Englishness in Pre- and Post-Brexit Referendum Literature, available now from Zero Books. Dulcie offers a fascinating look at various texts that attempt to grapple with what Brexit means for the future of Britain. And with that in mind, let's get right to the conversation with Dulcie Everett, author of Brexit, The Problem of Englishness in Pre- and Post-Brexit Referendum Literature. Welcome to Parallax Views, Dulcie Everett, author of Brexit, The Problem of Englishness in Pre- and Post-Brexit Referendum Literature. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Thank you for having me. So, Dulcie, maybe you could give a, a little bit of background on yourself and how you got into the topic of uh, English literature. And maybe we should define terms a little bit, because when we talk about English literature, where describing something very specific. We're not just describing uh, literature from the United Kingdom. So uh, maybe you could discuss that. Sure. So uh, I grew up in London, England, uh, born and raised here. I studied in the US, the University at Connecticut College. And I really, I've always loved studying uh, English at school. And when I got to university, uh, I was taking a whole wide range of courses, including um, I minored in government and philosophy. So I kind of brought together a few of my interests for my senior thesis in college, uh, which was in English. Uh, and I uh, 
had lived through the Brexit referendum. I saw a lot of new uh, texts emerging from, um, from British authors in response to the referendum. And so I decided kind of combining the government and, and English literature sides of things to explore what this new genre of literature was looking like. Um, so Brexit is uh, literature that was published immediately in response to the Brexit referendum. And uh, it, I define it as texts that were published from the date of the referendum. So June 23rd, 2016 to the 31st of December, 2020, which is when we officially left the European Union. And, and we should note here, when we say Brexit, we're not necessarily referring to literature that is saying, oh, Brexit bad or Brexit good. Although I, I think most of the literature you cover uh, probably leans towards uh, the Remain side of things, but rather it, it's not propaganda so much as trying to understand what Brexit means culturally and socially. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like you say, it is quite Remain focused, uh, the text that I look at. And I think that's just partly by virtue of the fact that Leave won the vote. And so the the kind of deconstructing that needed to happen was on the Remain side, trying to understand how it happened, you know, what it looks like, what what is Englishness looking like in um, in our country today that meant that England predominantly voted to leave the European Union. Uh, and as you say, kind of what are the implications of this moving forward? So it's not, it's definitely not propagandist. It's, um, it's really trying to understand uh, and almost project in some cases kind of where we go from here. And I should mention in some cases, people don't think we're going very far. We'll get into that. But first, I, I think we should go over uh, what breaks it was for the uh, members of my audience who may be a bit, uh, I don't know, I, I don't want to call them ignorant Yankees, but there, there's some <laughs> uh, members of the U.S. that I think they know about Brexit peripherally, but maybe they don't fully understand it because there's there's a large history to the idea of, of Euroscepticism and whatnot, but we'll, we'll get into that. But what was Brexit? Yes, so Brexit is the term that's used to describe the movement for Britain to leave the European Union. Uh, so it came to the fore in 2015 when the then Prime Minister David Cameron, um, a Conservative Prime Minister, promised a referendum vote on EU membership in his manifesto. So during a re-election campaign. So he did this primarily to appease Eurosceptic uh, Tory backbenchers. So it was seen as quite a self-serving move. Um, he didn't necessarily believe, or he didn't believe in leaving the European Union. And it was really a kind of um, appeasement process so that his backbenchers would um, feel he was doing enough to uh, either change, strengthen, or alter the relationship with the EU. So it's really a call to take a hard line approach to the relationship and do more to make sure that the UK was benefiting from the relationship. And, and we should note here, if people are confused by that term Eurosceptic, it basically just means skeptical of uh, the European right. Union. And it has a, a sort of long history that it sort of goes across the political spectrum in some ways. There used to be a sort of left Euroscepticism, and there's also a more, I think now it's associated more with the uh, sort of right wing. Yeah, totally. Now it's definitely, you think Eurosceptic, you think conservative, you think Tory backbenchers, you don't, um, you don't necessarily think Labour. Um, but you're right, it has been uh, cross party. So Euroscepticism has been prevalent in the UK since the inception of the EU. So um, I can give a brief overview. So the EU began as the European Coal and Steel Community in 1951. Uh, and post World War II, Winston Churchill called for a kind of European family. So closer ties across Europe that meant uh, that a war wouldn't happen like the one that we just lived through. But he didn't necessarily see the UK as a part of that. It was a call for something that was more led by um, France or Germany. It wasn't necessarily kind of the UK's place uh, in his view. But obviously, we did eventually uh, join. The European Corn and Steel community was initially six member states. Um, it was Luxembourg, the Netherlands, France, West Germany, Belgium, and Italy. And we initially declined to join. But we did begin a kind of formal relationship uh, over time. 
and we tried to enter, but we were vetoed entry by France twice. And from kind of this point onwards, there's a real kind of friction, almost a suspicion between um, the bloc and the UK. So the UK, a lot of MPs um, thought that France was vetoing entry so that they could create conditions that were favorable to France as opposed to uh, the UK. So, because when we joined, we would obviously get a seat at the table. So there was suspicion that that was the reason that we were vetoed entry. Uh, and there was obviously um, some animosity from, from the bloc itself. But we eventually joined in 1973 under Edward Heath, who was a conservative. Um, and again, there was animosity towards this decision. There was a kind of idea that the UK was historically incompatible with the EU. Um, it's an organization obviously that's based on power sharing and interdependence and it's not that's not something that the uk has been particularly involved with um but it was seen as a strong economic opportunity and then as you say it's kind of gone back and forth so in 1975 a labor government led by Har harold wilson held a referendum on eu membership it was then called the european economic community um and that was uh the population voted to stay in the EU and in, in the EEC at the time uh, by 67%. So it was a pretty overwhelming uh, yes vote. And then when you have Thatcher in power, um, the economy is structured. She comes to power in 1979. The British economy is struggling a little bit and there's fresh anger about what our contributions to the budget are. Um, and this again leads to a rise in Euroscepticism. So Thatcher became quite a prominent Eurosceptic. And she raised the alarm about this was a loss of control. We were kind of losing our, um, our sovereignty and the idea that we're being controlled by external forces. So a lot of people kind of trace Brexit back to her specifically for these. Yeah, I, I was going to say, so uh, <laughs> Boris Johnson wasn't the first one to say, I, I think his line was uh, take back control, right? Take back control. Yes. Yes. So that's kind of the modern uh, incantation of that. Yeah. And then, so who are the, the main forces that spearhead it? Brexit and what sort of led to it happening? So you had um, two key players. So uh, Nigel Farage is the leader, was the leader of the UK Independence Party. And he had been, um, the UKIP as it's known, uh, had kind of been gaining ground in the UK for a while. Um, its sole purpose was to lead the European Union. So it had been growing um, over time. And the second person was Boris Johnson. Um, he was uh, previously mayor of London, now he's obviously our prime minister. Um, and they both kind of spearheaded this campaign. So they were the main mouthpieces to leave. And I suppose in terms of how Brexit came to be, I think one of the things that David Cameron underestimated when he called for a referendum was these kind of simmering, not quite addressed tensions in the UK population, specifically in England. Um, there was feelings of disenfranchisement. Uh, things weren't necessarily going well for people, economically speaking. Obviously, you've got 2008 um, crash and you've really, a lot of people feeling um, like they did better before potentially we were even in the EU. So there's a lot of these tensions that are kind of just under the surface and they hadn't been tapped into for a while. Um, but you also had the rise of insurgent nationalisms in the UK um, that lead to a kind of English retaliation. And what I mean by that is the UK, so Britain, um, is the nation state that we live in, but there are sub-nationalisms. So English nationalism, Scottish nationalism, Welsh nationalism and Irish nationalism, none of them um, are, are directly related to the nation state. That would be Britishness. Right. So Englishness is kind of a subset of that. It's a proto-nationalism. It doesn't reflect the nation state. And when you have um, movements for Scottish independence, for example, that are sort of gaining ground and there have been referenda on that before, which have failed. Um, that, that's kind of, like uh, parties like the SNP and whatnot, right? Right. Yes. But my point is like um, you have an English pushback against these kind of rising nationalisms because Britain is quite Euro, uh, Anglo-centric uh, in its power. So power comes from Westminster and I can get into it more in, in, in a little, but essentially Englishness is formed more strongly in retaliation to these kind of rising forces. So you've got 
the combination of feeling like we've lost power in the EU because previously we were like a global hegemon and now we're just one among many powers. And you also have the pushback internally within the UK from uh, subnationalisms. So in England specifically, there's a kind of feeling that there's an encroaching, um, encroaching identities that maybe um, are going to disrupt the power balance that we are used to. And these, these are things that were tapped into by Farage and Johnson throughout the campaign. So there's a lot of rhetoric um, about, well, there was a lot of xenophobic rhetoric. Um, specifically, it was quite isolationist uh, in nature. And there was also, as you were saying about take back control, there's a nostalgic element to, uh, to the Brexit campaign, to the Leave campaign, uh, which was kind of mirrored in uh, the US by Donald Trump as well. So you make America great again, that's the same thing. And nostalgia is not a uh, unique, it, this isn't the only time nostalgia has been used, right? It's used all the time by politicians um, and across generations as well. It's not necessarily new, but it is quite uh, impactful. So then can we discuss more the, well, well, first, I guess we, we should get into this. I, I know a lot of people have said, well, why don't they just have a, a, a second referendum? And uh, my understanding is that's probably unfeasible. And mm -hmm. beyond that, my understanding is based on the polling, people would probably vote relatively the same way anyways. Yes. Um, so there was a recent poll that said that nine in 10 Brits would vote the same way again. Uh, I don't know if that one in 10 would, would change it, but I think, as you say, it wouldn't be feasible now, mainly because when the referendum was announced, it was uh, explicitly made binding. So uh, Cameron said that the results of this will be, uh, you know, respected. And you have, it was 51% majority. So it was a very small majority, which is why there's debate about whether we should have another one, right? And Labour in the aftermath sort of ran on the idea that we would have a second referendum. But for those who voted to leave, there's already a feeling of disenfranchisement of, um, in some cases, sort of anti-establishment and feeling unheard. And to go back on that and to say, well, this wasn't the outcome we were looking for and therefore we have to do it again, uh, would kind of entrench those views and, and it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be helpful for anybody, I don't think. So it's not feasible. And given that the manifesto promised that it would be a binding referendum, because you can have referenda that are not binding and that are kind of taken as guidance for the, uh, for the politicians to kind of gauge where the public is is out with an issue, but this wasn't one of those. And also, I guess it's important here, and this will get into uh, the subject of, of Englishness as an identity. Uh, we mentioned racism and xenophobia. I think some people uh, may not grasp um, the sort of currents uh, when it comes to racism and xenophobia in, in a place like England, at least here in the US, but they, I mean, there's similarities. Uh, between the U.S. and England in some ways, uh, because I, I think you can talk to some English people that, that may have uh, not only nostalgic views, but they, they see a sort of changing world around them, um, things becoming more multicultural, uh, you know, immigrants coming in, uh, Pakistani businesses, th things like that. Has that also had an effect uh, when it comes to the, the rise of uh, sort of an insurgent English nationalism? I think so. Uh, I think that's fair to say. And I, I want to say as well that I don't, I personally don't think that everyone who voted leave is, you know, a horrific racist person. Um, people had lots of different reasons for voting leave, but certainly uh, a lot of the, the actual violence that occurred during the campaign and in the aftermath of the campaign was racially motivated. Um, so you had kind of, you know, graffiti, go home, those, those kinds of things were um, prevalent in the aftermath. And there's a lot of discussion, you know, when you see the, the, when you talk about the collapse of the British Empire and England's kind of uh, contraction to a small, you know, privileged uh, European country, but uh, one that has the same amount of 
say as another European country in the EU, for example, a lot of um, a lot of that contraction of power is kind of associated with the arrival of immigrants. Uh, and also we have to remember the context in which Brexit was happening, right? So 2015 and 2016 was sort of the height of the Syrian refugee crisis. And this was something that was used by Farage in particular uh, to highlight something that was potentially threatening to uh, English people's way of life, to their jobs. There was the, the rhetoric of you will, your jobs are going to be taken by immigrants or immigrants are coming to use the NHS, you know, quite, well, very blanket statements um, that weren't necessarily reflective of the reality. And there was, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but there was a poster that he created of a line of refugees. Um, and it was the idea of the, of the poster was to say that they're kind of lining up at the border and they're coming in. And um, Farage said several times that Turkey was on the brink of joining the EU. And if Turkey joined, then there was kind of a bridge between the UK and the Middle East that meant that all of these refugees would flood in. So there was kind of a real panic around that that was not justified um, and really inflated a lot of previous, you know, uh, or existing xenophobia in the UK. So it certainly had a role to play. Real, real quick, and I know we didn't go over this before the show, but what were some of the other reasons people may have voted uh, leave? Because I know you said, I, you, you were pretty emphatic saying, I don't want to say that all uh, people who voted leave are, are racist or xenophobic in their reasoning, at least, uh, for mm -hmm. breaks. So maybe you could discuss that a little bit, because I, I think people overlook that. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think one of the main things is feeling left behind economically. Um, I think, in in my view, a lot of a lot of um, scapegoating that takes place, where you're saying that it's you know your plight is down to an immigrant or your plight is down to um, a person of color. These things are really to distract from government's own failings to provide for the for the people that they're supposed to be providing for. So if you feel that you have been left behind economically or you don't um, trust sort of establishment politicians to have your best interests at heart, then Brexit looks like an opportunity for change. And this is the other thing. I think where you have leave or remain, only one of those offers you a chance to, to have something different than what you have right now. And for some people, different is you know, was was much more exciting and, and offered hope where remain just meant more of the same. So I, I would say that those two are, are kind of key ones that maybe go overlooked, are overlooked. So I want to get into the literature aspect now. It, it's interesting because um, I'm not an expert on uh, English literature, UK literature, uh, but I, I've read a, a few different novels. Uh, and it was interesting because uh, it seems like a lot of the sentiments that may have contributed to Brexit, you could find in certain uh, elements of English literature uh, le leading up, or at least English pop culture um, leading up to uh, Brexit. I, I remember I read a book called um, The Football Factory uh, by John King, which was pretty controversial when it debuted, but you could see some of the uh, sort of sentiments of, oh, we're, we're disenfranchised and and whatnot, um, and even sort of racist sentiments uh, discussed in that novel. And that novel, I think, was out in, let me see, 1996. So th these sentiments have been around in, uh, you know, English life since before breaks, right? Absolutely. And like I said, I think this is one of the things that Cameron sort of underestimated was the strength of feeling around this and the fact that these tensions were already very much in play. So um, yeah, in my book, I cover, I cover three pre-referendum texts and five Brexit texts. And the point of the pre-referendum texts is really to, to set the stage, show, as you say, what, what authors are writing about prior because they are considering these things uh, already. So the first is The Rotters Club, which was published in um, 1998. And that is uh, by Jonathan Coe. Then I discuss a play by Jez Butterworth, which is Jerusalem, and then uh, another novel, England, England by Julian Barnes. And all three 
look at Englishness as kind of problematic concepts. And I suppose one of the ones I um, I like to talk about is Jerusalem by Jez Butterworth. So uh, for those who haven't heard of it, the general outline is the main character uh, is called Johnny Byron, Johnny Rooster Byron. He lives in a caravan uh, and the local council is trying to evict him because he's squatting on land that he doesn't own. Uh, and Byron becomes kind of exaggerated, you know, mythical guardian of English soil in the play. So the whole play revolves around him defending his very small piece of land. And lots of the characters who are in the play kind of come into his space and they, they're talking, they're quite xenophobic. They're, they discuss how Europe feels like it's getting closer almost physically. Um, they discuss only watching local news, but local news means, uh, you know, that they have the opportunity to know the weather girl, for example. Um, so they feel very, very uh, like their immediate space is, is where they're based and they don't want to go anywhere else. So one of the characters, for example, is going to go to Australia and Johnny Byron's like, why would you want to go there? Like, you'll be back within a year. Um, so it's uh, very Anglo-centric and essentially they reject globalization. Uh, is this, I, I think some people... Country. Not, not to interrupt you. I'm, I'm sorry, but I think I think sometimes this has been referred to, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but like a the the sort of little Englander mindset mm -hmm. is what I've heard this referred to as. Yes, that's right. Um, middle England is also uh, used quite a lot in the Brexit discussions, and actually one of the books that I one of the Brexit texts uh, that I discuss is Middle England, and that was kind of the the word used to or the phrase to describe people in in sort of the Midlands area who are very staunch Brexit supporters. Um, but yeah, that's right. So Little Englander is, is exactly what Johnny Byron represents. Um, but also he's he is kind of glorified as this defender of English soil. So the play is either complete satire or it's a really invigorating kind of promotion uh, of this form of Englishness, depending on how you're watching it, depending on how you interpret it. Uh, and there's several articles that kind of praise it for making people feel really connected to England and to the land, uh, which is something that we're not necessarily used to doing anymore. Kind of, we, we often look um, at our global community as opposed to kind of being based specifically on English soil. So as you're saying, these, these are topics that are already coming up. And um, I think, again, this was just something that was really overlooked uh, and it was kind of laughed off almost you know, this that people will never don't don't, don't feel that strongly, or um, there's no possibility that that leave will win. But actually, you can already see that a lot of these discussions are taking place, and uh, obviously, obviously, it did win. <laughs> if you could, since you mentioned another book there, uh, the Rotters Club uh, from yeah. 2001, Jonathan Coe. That's an interesting book that takes place, uh, I think, in the 1970s. It's about teenagers and uh, them living through things like uh, IRA bombings, uh, you know, punk rock and, and, and sort of it's coming of age type stuff. Uh, could you discuss that novel a little bit and why you included it in the book? Yeah. So, yeah, it's a coming of age uh, text, as you say. So the Rotters Club is the first in um, a series of books which culminates with Middle England, which was the Brexit, Brexit text that I covered, as I mentioned before. So um, Middle England is a kind of a revival of the characters from the Rotters Club that show how they reacted to, to Brexit. Um, so Jonathan Coe, like you say, starts in 1970 and it follows the characters through their kind of awakenings, political awakenings. Um, and it discusses things from uh, sort of Welsh, it well, discusses Welsh nationalism, it discusses racism that's embedded uh, within institutions, but also within uh, schools. So one character um, in the book. Yeah, so the main character in The Rotters Club is uh, Benjamin Trotter. And he goes to a school called King Edward School. And there's a lot of a lot of the book is dedicated to his relationships with his classmates. And one of the classmates is Steve Richards, and he's the only black people in their year. And he becomes the target of, um, of either subconscious or pointed racism throughout the book, uh, specifically at the hands of a character called Culpepper. He's a real bully, he's a racist. And uh, throughout the book, you get 
a sense of the, the isolation that Steve Richards feels um, during their final exams. Culpepper drugs uh, Steve so that he fails his exams and doesn't get his place at Cambridge. Uh, and Benjamin Trotter, though he feels sympathy for Steve Richards, also feels that he can't intervene. So you get a real sense of these simmering tensions. Um, and you also see not just the pupils, but their parents as well, who were working at a factory. Uh, and one of the one of their bosses says that we're kind of living in this post-racial society and everything's equal and the, the struggles of racism are over. And obviously that's simply not the case. Um, so you get a real sense of how this is all playing out in the 1970s and uh, on a really um, personal basis. And as you said, um, they lived through IRA attacks. So uh, Benjamin Trotter's sister's uh, fiance uh, is killed by an IRA bomb, spoiler alert, <laughs> um, that is killed by a bomb uh, that's planted in a pub in Birmingham by the IRA. So you have Irish nationalism coming to the fore. You also see Benjamin travel to Wales and meet a Welsh nationalist. And there's this kind of um, moment where he realizes that there are people outside of England who feel differently um, than he has grown up to feel. And he, he talks specifically also about the media um, and how the media portray nationalists from um, like the IRA or, or Welsh nationalists as people who just burn everything down and don't really have uh, a reason to feel this way. And when he speaks to people uh, in Wales, he realizes that they have reasons um, that they can uh, verbalize. I'm not suggesting that he uh, condones the violence. He doesn't and neither does the book, but there's a kind of an attempt to understand uh, which doesn't happen naturally for, for Benjamin when he's based in, in his home city of Birmingham. So yes, it's a, it's a coming of age. It really gives you a bit of a, a sense of what's going on at this kind of time when we're joining the EU and uh, what, is the, what is the feeling? Um, and as I said, it's, it's a series of books. So you have um, the second text is The Closed Circle and that deals with how the characters react to 9-11. Uh, and then uh, Jonathan Coe was sort of felt he was done with it until Brexit and he revived the characters in Middle England. So I wanted to kind of give a, one example of um, a series of books as well. So you see the characters growing up and you see how they react later in life, sort of middle aged. Uh, and they all they all respond differently, though, though Benjamin Trotter is um, very European uh, aligned. So it's interesting since the IRA came up, we're, we're taught, we, we mentioned Scottish and, and Welsh and uh, Irish is sort of independence movements. What's the difference between these various forms of nationalism and or, or sub-nationalisms? And what can we learn about them from Brexit? And, and I ask that specifically because I, I think the topic has arisen more since Brexit, because my understanding is that, say, Scotland and Ireland uh, were more on the sort of Remain side. So there's always been this argument of, well, why should we be under the 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 sort of role of, um, you know, people who voted against what we voted for? Yeah, absolutely. You're completely right. So Brexit very much drew out those differences. And um, Scotland and Northern Ireland voted to remain in the EU, while uh, England and then Wales, by a small margin, voted to leave. So Welsh nationalism is usually seen as a more tampered down version of, of nationalism. So there are certainly separatist movements in Wales, but compared to Scottish nationalism, for example, which has had recent referenda on Scottish independence, it's not as strong necessarily. And I think this has something to do, I'm not an expert in the you know, formation of the UK, but I, I do know that um, Wales was uh, politically incorporated into England first under Henry VIII. And then um, you have the kind of slower accumulation of, of Scotland and then Ireland, which then breaks away the Republic of Ireland. And then you have the, the, e, uh, the UK as we know it from 1949. So the kind of more recent um, uh, incorporation of Scotland and, and Northern Ireland into the UK has borne more violence uh, 
in Ireland's case, of course, you have there is a Republic of Ireland and there's Northern Ireland, so you have an actual separation within the country itself. Um, and that was uh, the IRA's goal was to uh, bring Ireland back together. Uh, so I think the difference really is not just time, but the manner in which um, Scotland and Northern Ireland were um, incorporated was also more violent itself. Uh, I'm sure you know about you know Jacobite rebellion in Scotland and Battle of Culloden, and uh, so you had real occupation of Scotland during that period of time in the 1700s. Uh, and you didn't necessarily have that in Wales. So I think that's really where the difference lies from my perspective. So then when it comes to Englishness as an identity, how how is that sort of identity formed and how do we see it uh, sort of play out in literature over the years? And and how does it change from, uh, say, when Britain was an empire to, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of post-empire period? So as I mentioned earlier, English nationalism is often formed in opposition to others. So uh, when you have the rise of insurgent nationalisms within the UK, you have a kind of pushback by England to try and create our own identity. And when I say in the book, the problem of Englishness, what I really mean is that Englishness is something that's really difficult to define and difficult to pin down. And if you ask people in England, can you define it? I don't, I certainly wouldn't have been able to do that. You know, I still don't think I can. It sounds like it's a very amorphous concept. It is. It, that's right. That's exactly the right word. It's very kind of slippery and it doesn't, it doesn't have firm roots necessarily. So going back to empire. So we created an identity that was based on dominance and uh, the, you know, the power um, or the accumulation of power across the globe. And during the Victorian era in particular, uh, Englishness or English nationalism was often associated with naval and military strength uh, and a xenophobic attitude towards foreigners. So when you have the collapse of empire post-war, you get a crisis of identity. You know, we have been viewing ourselves as this global hegemon, um, defeated, uh, you know, we've won both world wars, but we've kind of economically, we've really suffered through the wars uh, and now we're losing ground and we're kind of having to redefine what Englishness means. It's no longer global hegemony. So at the same time as you have the empire collapsing, you have the rise of the EU and you go from being global hegemon to being one among many powers. Uh, and this is that contraction of power I was talking about earlier. And one of the um, people I refer to in the book, one of the experts I talk about is Fintan O'Toole, and he's an Irish political commentator. And he suggests that English nationalism in its current modern form is reliant on self-pity. And what he means by this is that there's a simultaneous impulse in Englishness for dominance and for liberation. So on the one hand, we feel like we are exceptional on the world stage, and we you know, should or, or do still in some ways have this um, power and on the other hand, we feel that that power is being encroached upon by the EU. And so we want to liberate ourselves from this oppressive force, supposedly. Meanwhile, we were oppressing, you know, <laughs> most of the world for throughout the empire. So the search for English identity is just really based in trying to reconcile those two impulses. And that's why it doesn't really work, because there's not, um, there's not anything to root it in. And I should also say that a lot of modern nationalisms are created in response to um to an oppressive to, to an oppressor like like england or like britain uh and they create a cultural distinctiveness that separates them from that oppressive force it's about a reclaiming of borders or of um, sovereignty and england has never needed that we've never had to make ourselves culturally distinctive because we set out to make the world in our image and we still have power concentrated um, in Westminster within the UK. And I mean, within the EU even, we had just a, a seat at the table just like everybody else did. So we weren't being controlled by something external that we had no influence over. Um, does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I, sometimes I think about this when I look at like um, older 
uh, forms of British popular culture. I grew up, this is embarrassing to admit, but I, mm-hmm. I grew up watching uh, those old cheesy uh, Hammer Studios horror movies. And uh, it's interesting because uh, I, I think those type of movies uh, sort of fit in with that, like, oh, we don't know what our identity is post, uh, post-Empire. post And it, they're very nostalgic films, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then you have uh, different forms of, of pop culture arising at the time, like punk rock and, you know, industrial music. And, and those are very much in another direction. So I think you can see a lot of turbulence in that post-World War II period. Yeah, absolutely. And as I say, um, there was the the kind of push from Churchill himself for this European family, but there was the idea that the UK shouldn't be involved in that. It's not our role or we're exceptional in some way. I don't want to say we thought we were like too good for it, but I think we, was, we saw it as something that needed to take place uh, without us because our interests, for example, like, yeah, I want to say interests might not be the right word, but our, I guess, goals as a nation sort of lay elsewhere. We wanted to remain sovereign, remain uh, as this exceptional country. And we talk about American exceptionalism as well as uh, English exceptionalism for different reasons, but um, it's definitely had a very lasting impact on how we view ourselves. So I want to get into post-Brexit literature, but uh, before we do that, real, real quick, for my U.S. audiences, what are the parallels that we can draw and maybe also the, the differences uh, between uh, sort of insurgent nationalism in, say, the U.S. Uh, compared to insurgent nationalisms uh, rising in, in the U.K.? This is a good question. I mean, I often draw parallels uh, when I think about Brexit. I think about Donald Trump. Um, as I think most people do, mainly because, I mean, they took place in the same year, right? So it was very one after the other. Brexit took place in June and Trump was inaugurated, or was, uh, the vote was in November, was inaugurated in January of the next year. Uh, I think, I wonder if I can really speak to the the differences, I guess. Well, I, I, knew, I know, I think you do mention it in the book that there, there's probably things that are distinct about, you know, the, the situation or the identity crises uh, within the UK. Yeah, I think when I yeah, what, what I mean by that I suppose is we don't have that firm identity uh to to attach ourselves to. I think in the US the the patriotism from the US is is often a lot more rooted in something real. You know, the constitution is is really where that lies and I um I see you know when I talk to people who are proud of being American it's it's the constitution. And when you talk about proud of being English, there's kind of, cause you can't, there's nowhere to go. Like um, if you talk about loving the empire, you know, that's awful. You can't, that's not right. Cause it was a horrible, um, very violent period of our history. And that often gets glossed over. And I think nationalism in general, um, one of the, one of the uh, people that I quote, who talks about nationalism is Tom Nairn. And he talks about how, Nationalism uh, is is a form of neurosis, and it has a capacity for dementia, for 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 a slide into dementia. Meaning that when you are entrenched in a nationalist view of your or a nationalist um, identity, you you have a tendency to forget the more brutal parts of your own history. And then you see this in the U.S. as well, with kind of glossing over the period of slavery, um, not looking at the remnants of institutional racism that have uh, come through time. And in England, you get that with either attributing greatness to the empire or or just kind of glossing over it altogether. So you have a capacity to forget about those periods of your history. If we could too, since you mentioned uh, Fintan O'Toole, uh, mm-hmm. it's really interesting. Um, you mentioned that he has a book that sort of describes uh, a lot of the phenomena we're talking about. Uh, and it's called Heroic Failure. And he yeah. quotes Orwell as saying, English literature, like other literatures, is full of battle poems. But it is worth noticing that the ones that have won for themselves a kind of popularity are always a tale of disasters and retreat. Can we talk a little bit about this idea of uh, heroic failure and what O'Toole is getting at in, in his book? Yeah, so he's talking about the charge of the light brigade, I think, in that scenario. Uh, and all about how military failure is um, 
inspires this poetry that's really fiercely English. Uh, it's kind of seeks to unite us, I suppose, as a nation in uh, protecting one another. Um, I, I suppose another example I can draw from Brexit, actually, uh, I, I look at a book of poetry by um, uh, Geoffrey Hill, which is called The Book of Baruch by the Gnostic Justin. And in those poems, he talks a lot about how during the Blitz, London was sort of decimated and we had loads of you know, ruins everywhere and we still find ruins throughout London today. And under those ruins were other ruins from our history. And it's all about, um, Hill takes a very pessimistic approach to, to Brexit actually, but he does, he does say that um, that kind of rebuilding over time makes us stronger as a, as a country. And coming back from things like the Blitz, that's, you know, it's not a military failure per se, but it is that kind of same feeling of uh, being either damaged or defeated in some way and coming together. Uh, I think that's how I view uh, both of those, um, that Orwell statement as well is kind of coming together in the face of adversity. That's what makes us a great nation. We, uh, you know, we, we might fail, but we fail heroically, uh, as Fintan O'Toole suggests, yeah. And that's a lot of what you're sort of trying to parse out in Brexit is how this literature is, in large part, Brexit is about trying to understand the ways in which we deal with something like Brexit, right? Uh, the, the, the sort of emotional response to it. Yeah, definitely. And and authors respond to it differently, either with, with hope or with hopelessness. Who is an author that you would say maybe responds more hopefully to all of this? I, I think there was one author that I was interested in talking with you about, Ollie Smith. Ollie Smith, yeah. Yeah, she's... Um, so Ali Smith's Autumn was sort of the, the first Brexit text. It was published in October of 2016, so a matter of months after the referendum. And on my reading, it is a hopeful um, text. It's a, it's a hopeful outlook on how we can move forward from Brexit. So she, she opens the book with a Dickensian refrain. It was the worst of times. It was the worst of times. So as opposed to it was the, worst, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Um, she just sees Brexit as this really sort of cataclysmic moment of, um, I want to say, I want to say anger almost. This is a kind of like, it was, it's just dreadful. Uh, and she moves through the text with this approach, but there are a lot of strands of really hopeful uh, symbolism to take out of it. So autumn for one, it's, a, it's the first in a seasonal quartet. So uh, the first is autumn. And she published Winter, Spring and Summer. And the theme of time and the seasons as sort of rejuvenating forces comes through across the text. So you see uh, the cyclicality. She talks a lot about the cyclicality of history. So things are built and things fall apart. And so this is just another kind of uh, another moment where something was built. We joined the EU and we'll, we'll leave the EU. And, and that's just a, a feature of time. And it's how we go through time constantly. So she sees it as almost, I don't want to say an inevitability, but in a way, an inevitability, you know, history moves and, uh, and we kind of, we, we grow from it, but we also circle back to these moments that uh, we've maybe thought we had got past. So she sees time as this rejuvenating force. Um, there's also uh, an intergenerational friendship in autumn between a young woman and a man who was on his deathbed. And during the Brexit referendum, there was a real uh, feeling that the division between leave and remain was one of, of, it was a generational divide. So you had the older population voting to leave and the younger population voting to remain. I think partly just because, you know, young people, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to offend anyone, but young people um, who had only known the EU, you know, that's, that, that's all we know. So how do we, how do we know what we're looking at when we say we want to leave the EU? Whereas an older generation will remember what it was like before the EU. So that has something to do with it. But anyways, their relationship in the text is, is one of, um, of genuine love. Uh, so 
their, their neighbors and it's a kind of familial love that develops throughout the text, even though uh, Daniel Gluck, who is the 101 year old, I think he's 101, um, he's sort of slipping in and out of, of death. So that's another one of the hopeful moments. And at the end of the text, she kind of, Ali Smith taps back into that rejuvenation. So there's the image of a rose, of a white rose, and um, that's the symbol of, of England. Um, and it's kind of this growing back from, from, I suppose, the ashes of Brexit. How do we grow back from this? And there is the idea that we'll come back either stronger or learning the lessons. Um, but there's a real pragmatism to, to Ali Smith as well. She's kind of, like I said, she's almost, she's not indifferent to it, but there is an indifference to, this is just to the pattern of history. Um, we're just, we're at the moment, we're in a trough of history. But, but, we'll, but we'll end up through. getting through it. Exactly. Yeah. So the opposite end of that, I guess, <laughs> would be uh, Ian McEwen's uh, sort of spin on Kafka, uh, and it's called The Cockroach. And I have to be honest, uh, that book really, 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 really lays it on thick in ways yeah. that uh, I know a lot of people are very critical of, but maybe discuss that book for people that are unfamiliar with it. Yeah, sure. So The Cockroach is a novella. It's, very, it's a short novel. Uh, and it's a play on, as you say, on Kafka's The Metamorphosis. So The Metamorphosis is a story of a salesman who wakes up one day to find himself turned into an insect. Uh, in McEwen's version, a cockroach finds itself drawn towards Parliament and transfigured into the Prime Minister. Now, having watched politics as a cockroach, the cockroach is able to play the role of the Prime Minister very convincingly, so goes into Prime Minister's questions on Wednesday in Parliament and um, you know, yells at everyone and essentially the cockroach can inhabit the body of, of the prime minister. And while in, in the body of the prime minister, the cockroach advocates for a new economic policy called reversalism, which in the book would take the UK backwards and create really, really dire living conditions. So it's an economic policy in the book that would just basically create, uh, would, would take us back in time essentially to a a state of living which would allow cockroaches to thrive, meaning it's dirty, it's, um, yeah, dire <laughs> is the word I would use for it. Uh, so over the course of the book, it turns out that a lot of other cabinet members are also cockroaches that have transfigured into humans. Uh, so there's a whole cabinet of cockroaches that have infiltrated the government and they oust any member of the government who, who isn't a cockroach and who kind of displays actual humanity. Uh, and it's, it's almost a form of anthropomorphism in the book, but it's, it's symbolic meaning is that the politicians we have in the real world are acting like cockroaches who are trying to take us back to this period of history where, where cockroaches are able to thrive as opposed to human beings. So like you say, it's a very, very harsh assessment and there's been a lot of criticism um, that it's sort of a, a smugly middle class perspective. It, takes, it makes no attempt to understand what the impulse is for Brexit. Not to interrupt you, but... I, I remember yeah. I, I mentioned to someone that I was going to do a show on on your book, Brexit. And I said, oh, she talks about this book, uh, The Cockroach by Ian McEwen. And their, their immediate response was very visceral. They just rolled their eyes, uh, not yeah. to your book, but they said, oh, no, yeah. <laughs> he's so middle class, Ian McEwen. Uh. Yeah, no, I mean, that was uh, one of the quotes I, I quote in the book. One of the critical reactions was that you can hear people, you know, giggling from their from their nice houses, um, while much of the country obviously does not share this view. Um, I think also it's, I didn't point this out in my book, but something I've, I've recognized later is, you know, with the metamorphosis, the story, it's a story of a salesman, the main character is a salesman who wakes up to find himself transfigured into an insect, but because he's a salesman and the cockroach is a play on this, I think McEwen's portraying politicians as salesmen, um, almost like a snake oil salesman, you know, I'm going to get this reverses and this economic policy and it's gonna um it's gonna serve you but it actually won't it's for the cockroach who's gonna leave afterwards and and in the um in the text as soon as reversalism is uh approved and it's gone through and it's in in play uh the cockroaches morph back into themselves and kind of scuttle away altogether and there's a very impassioned speech that one of them gives to <laughs> all of the other cockroaches in the book i mean it's for me, I, I did read it. It is a, maybe distasteful, um, but it 
is really helpful because it portrays or it reveals and explores the polarization that emerged from Brexit. So just like in the US, it's an extremely polarized country at the moment. The UK throughout Brexit, it was, it really was incredibly divided. And it was something that leached into conversations at the dinner table. You know, I'd never experienced politics at the dinner table necessarily, but it became a, a, a feature of everyday conversation. And it was something you couldn't really escape. And you had to take, you had to take a stand one way or the other. So it's very divisive and the cockroach is one of the better examples of just how polarized the country becomes that, you know, McEwen puts forward this argument that the only, the only explanation for this is that cockroaches uh, are in power. So. Yeah. It, it sounds like he's essentially saying that, uh, you know, the, the politicians of our country are, are going to take us into an autocracy. Yeah. Yeah, and one that's completely self-serving and in the wrong direction, um, taking us backwards rather than forwards. And of course, that was a lot of the view that Remain, um, or that was the position of Remain. And I should say also something I haven't mentioned, and one of the reasons that I think Leave, you know, won the referendum was the Remain campaign didn't really run on anything at all apart from opposition to Leave. So there was an effort to kind of undermine everything that Leave was saying. And in a lot of cases, it was right. You know, the Boris Johnson said that if we left the EU, we'd be able to send 350 million pounds a week to the NHS. And that was a lie. Um, so it was trying to undermine these, um, these statements. But there was not, on, on the Leave side, they said that Remain was project fear because they were just saying that, oh, well, if we leave the EU, we're gonna go into economic collapse. Um, or they were just criticizing Leave. So there wasn't a very good effort from the Remain side to say why being in the EU was so important or so beneficial. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why um, it didn't manage to, to persuade people. Um, but yeah, like I say, it's just, it was such a divisive policy uh, and those those divisions haven't necessarily gone away either as you, as we said before you know nine in ten people would vote the same way and I don't think the strength of feeling personally that you know going out and about and, and day to day it's not you don't notice it the same way that you did um, it was almost palpable around the referendum I went out uh, into London the day before and people were leafleting and there was a like a genuine change in energy um, that people were nervous or people were mobilized and then the next day there was this kind of feeling in London particularly of um defeat and anger as well so yeah as we're saying McEwen's book is is really one of the best examples of of how we can preserve that feeling um and I think one of the one of the main reasons I was inspired to write the book in the first place was that I think Brexit is not just they're not just fictional texts or they're not just poems they're almost documents of history and they allow us to tap into that immediate moment in a way that if the authors had taken five years to reflect and really, you know, kind of almost calm, let the situation calm down before writing about it, we wouldn't have had these texts come out because this was really like, it was immediate. It was, um, and it was very In a charged. way, not, not to interrupt you, but in a way, uh, these are books that allow us or, or when they were, you know, published, especially, uh, they, they were sort of used for sense making in some ways. Like, how do we make sense of all this? Yeah, yeah, and like I said, I think that deconstruction has to take place on the Remain side because it was a shock. I don't think anyone, even on the Leave, uh, even the leaders of the Leave campaign, didn't expect to win. You know, I remember watching Boris Johnson give his speech on the day that the referendum vote was announced. Um, it's kind of a victory speech, but he he actually looked quite shocked, uh, almost kind of pale, a little bit scared. Like, what are we? Because there was no plan. Um, it was. I don't. I don't want to get too into the to pointing fingers or any of that. But I. But I think it was kind of a self-serving move for for Johnson in particular, the same way that 
Cameron felt it was a self-serving move to offer the referendum. Well, e- even um, uh, like I think Nigel Farage basically had to reinvent yeah. himself after um, yeah, well, Brexit because that, it's like his whole identity was based on that. Yeah, well, that was the reason the UK Independence Party existed, right? So they had to kind of disband it and um, he took a break from politics. I mean, to be fair to McEwen, um, that idea of delivering what you've said you're going to deliver and then running away afterwards was completely accurate. In the case of Farage, he just left. He's come come back into the fore a little bit now, but as you say, you have to kind of yeah redefine yourself. Uh, but Johnson saw it as an opportunity to build his political credentials and his uh, his sort of campaign to become prime minister basically started with Brexit. Before closing out here, there was just one more thing I wanted to mention if you have time. So there's another book that you deal with, and I like the title of it, Perfidious Albion, which uh, it's a very pejorative phrase uh, used within international relations diplomacy, uh, which basically deals with, you know, acts of treachery in um, international relations. So maybe you could tell my listeners a little bit about that book and maybe why that title was chosen, although I think people can figure out why. Yeah, so... Um, I can give you the the definition of um, Phineas Albion if I can find it as well. Yeah, so as you say, it's an international relations term, meaning England or Britain considered as treacherous in international affairs. Um, So one thing about, so the author of Phineas Albion is Sam Byers, and he explicitly says uh, in an interview uh, about his book that he went out, he set out to capture the, the feeling of Brexit. So he was doing that kind of work to capture what what was the feeling, what were the tensions. And Perfidious Albion is really, um, it's a book that's all about tech infiltration. Um, it relates a lot to the Cambridge Analytica scandal. So essentially it's based in a small town in England, Edmondsbury, and a tech firm is unbeknownst to the residents, using the residents of Edmondsbury in kind of a data mining experiment. Um, And there's a lot of discussion about clickbait culture. So how do people uh, react to certain headlines? Um, There's a journalist in the book who becomes a real clickbait journalist uh, for his own gain. And he he feels uncomfortable about it, but but, um, his uh, editor says, this is how you're gonna make money. This is how you're gonna get readers. this is what you're going to do now, basically. So it's very, it's very tech focused. I guess in closing, what do you hope that listeners get out of uh, your book, Brexit? Because, you know, I, I think it is an important exploration of the, the shock of Brexit in a lot of ways. Yeah, sure. So the book is separated into three parts. So I've got the first part of the book is a very brief overview of uh, the lead up, the the historical and political precedent to Brexit. So I think that first part will just give readers a real sense of, uh, you know, an abridged sense of how Brexit came to be. But the bulk of the book is part two, which is the literature. And what I really set out to do was to show the ways that literature influences culture and culture influences literature how they're kind of, it's a symbiotic relationship and literature can allow us to understand and evaluate current uh, political affairs, I suppose, in new ways that we're not able to do on our own. So looking at Brexit from the perspective of a fictional character, no matter how you felt about it in the time, you're forced to look at it through a new lens. You're forced to understand maybe a character you don't agree with, um, or at least sympathize with them. And that's something that's unique to literature and to, to art that I think is really important. And like I said, I, Brexit is that they're not just fictional texts, they're these documents of history. And I think we can use them as like time capsules in a way. They capture the political moment and they, they store them so that we can remember what it was like and how to either avoid it or deal with it better in the future. So the goal of my book is not to portray one reading either. I am really encourage readers to, to go into the book and take their own conclusions away. I'm sure people won't agree with all of my readings and I'm sure they're not all, um, you know, 
I'm sure there will be loads of more uh, people who come out and talk about Brexit in the future. So I'm excited to kind of read those as well. So it's not it's not supposed to be uh, a, this kind of speech or this lecture on what you should think about these texts. It's really just an exploration of, of how can we read this in uh, in the current context? What can we take away and, and, and how do we move forward? Um, because the authors don't necessarily give us a roadmap out of Brexit. But as I've mentioned before, there's, there's texts that are hopeful, there's texts that are hopeless. I personally prefer to, to look on the optimistic side. I think we've learned a lot over the last sort of six years about uh, polarization, division, how we, how, you know, topics like Brexit become so heated that they almost throw all reason out the window and we just kind of come from this really emotional perspective and, and Brexit does capture that, but how do we look at these texts as kind of informing uh, our approach moving forward to, to issues like this, to divisive issues like this? What for you was some of the texts that you found more hopeful? I mean, we already mentioned Autumn. Was there any other text that sort of you thought had a more hopeful approach or at least an approach that tried to understand not even where people were coming from on a political basis on leave and remain, but like why they felt the way they did. Yeah. So Middle England by Jonathan Coe was another one that I felt when I read it was more hopeful. Um, it's very, very much rooted in reality. So where Perfidious Albion and the Cockroach are kind of dystopian um, texts, you have Middle England really takes a realism, a realist approach to, to Brexit. And as I said before, it follows the characters uh, from the Rotters Club, so Benjamin Trotter and his friends, uh, as they move through the referendum. So there, it goes um, through quite a lot of time as well. So it goes from around uh, 2010, I think, to uh, 2018, which is when it was published. Um, so it gives you a kind of overview of, of that whole time period. But... I don't want to say that it ends necessarily with a hopeful note for England itself because the book ends in Europe. So the after Brexit, uh, Benjamin Trotter, who is very Europe aligned, moves to France with his sister Lois and they kind of start a new life there. And, and a lot of the characters that you meet throughout the book who are from all over the place, so whether they're from the UK or uh, from European countries, come together in France. Uh, there's a lot of, um, I don't know if can I swear on the podcast? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, there's a lot of kind of fuck Brexit and, um, that the hopefulness that comes at the end of middle England is not in England itself. If that makes sense. Yeah, it, so, it sounds like Trotter at the end of that ends up almost like shedding his, his sense of yeah. Englishness. Yeah, he does. And, um, there's also throughout the book, you see, Benjamin listening to certain uh, types of music. Um, at the beginning, he's listening to music with his father who, who dies just after casting his Brexit vote, which is a very pointed, uh, I suppose, criticism of uh, people who were voting for something that was never going to affect them. Um, not sure I completely agree, but yes, uh, they're listening to some music and uh, it's French music and Benjamin's dad tells him to turn it off. Uh, it's not we know what he wants to listen to. Benjamin listens to a lot of European music and finds a lot of identity in that European music. He also listens to English music before the referendum and finds kind of a home in that uh, and then goes back to uh, European composers. So there's a kind of to and froing, but you're right, he does kind of shed his Englishness at the end of the book. But for him, it's a hopeful vision of, of global cooperation um so perhaps it's more of a i can i can find what i want outside of of england now it sounds like what he's saying is uh breaks that may have happened but cosmopolitanism isn't dead right yeah you can find it elsewhere um though i suppose leaving the eu makes it more difficult to live in france doesn't it but um yeah so i think Middle England as well, one of the things that I liked about Middle England is that it does it does give 
uh, albeit a stereotypical voice to people who vote leave as well. So it kind of portrays people who are um, finding themselves in a culture of political correctness that they don't recognize, um, pushing back against that as part of the impulse for leave. Uh, but it does it does create actual conversations between leave and remain uh, characters in the book, which which some other uh, texts do not offer. So there's an attempt at conversation understanding, but it's it is most certainly coming from a remain perspective, and I think it in some cases is generalized. Um, but at least it it does give you that kind of sense. Of, of what different people on different sides of the political spectrum are feeling. It sounds like it's a like slightly more nuanced about the, the people themselves than maybe Ian McEwan's The Cockroach. Absolutely more nuanced than The Cockroach, yes. Um, yes, definitely. <laughs> well, hey, I want to thank you, uh, Dulce Everett, for coming on Parallax Views. We ran over an hour. This usually happens. Um, <laughs> I want to thank you for staying over because I think this is a really fascinating book and I hope people... We'll pick it up. Uh, how can people keep up with your work and how can they uh, purchase a copy of the book? It's out from uh, Zero Books, right? It's Zero Books, yes. Uh, you can get a copy on Amazon, on Barnes & Noble, um, Waterstones if you're based in the UK. So all major retailers uh, online, you can find the book. Uh, and for keeping up with me, um, I'm at Dulce Everett on Instagram and my website is dulceeverett.com. So you can find me over on there. Uh, I blog occasionally. So yeah, but thank you so much for having me. This was a great conversation. I really appreciate your interest in Brexit. Well, that does it for this edition of Parallax Views. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dulce Everett and that you'll check out her book, Brexit, The Problem of Englishness in Pre and Post breaks it referendum literature. As always, if you support the work here I do at Parallax Views, please, please, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash Parallax Views. One more time, that's patreon.com slash Parallax Views. You can find all the information for how you can support this show financially on the Patreon page. And with that being said, until next time, you've been listening to Parallax Views with Parallax Views to Parallax Views with Parallax Views. The way out is not simply to say "Don't do it." That's to prohibit. It's nothing else. If we don't do it, others will be doing this like crazy. So, you know, we have to confront the problem. But no, basically, basically, I'm, I know of the great anxiety problems, new forms of control, but it's also new forms of freedom. This is why I always emphasize that uh, uh, internet and all this new digital stuff it's a very ambiguous phenomenon, but it's the field of struggle. New forms of enslavement, but at the same time, new incredible forms of freedom. We have to accept the fight with no nostalgia for old, allegedly more authentic communities or whatever. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid.